I see many of our institutions being threatened so strongly that the fundamental nature of our civilization, I think, is at risk. And that's it's no clearer that this is the case uh, than in the arts right now as well. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. The influence of wokeness, a loose set of leftist beliefs that put race at the center of every discussion and which seek to undermine traditional values about individualism, meritocracy, and equal opportunity in favor of advocacy for equality of outcomes or equity has become pervasive in American society. Its dominance in academia, public education, and popular culture has become too obvious to ignore. That it has migrated it from college campuses to the public square, and started to become a factor in our political life, is equally concerning. But while the way the late-night comedy shows seek to influence our discourse or the impact that Hollywood has on our society is much discussed, there is another, another aspect of this struggle that is often ignored, the influence of wokeness on the arts, including both the study of and performance of classical music. In the last year, the same forces seeking to change the rest of society have been seeking to intervene in the fine arts, whether it concerns the work of theater companies, the paintings or statues displayed in museums, or the performance of music in concert halls and opera houses. While this didn't begin in June 2020, when the death of George Floyd set off the demonstrations and riots that brought the Black Lives Matter movement to prominence, it has made a tremendous impact on the artistic world, and not for the better. So this week, Top Story will take a break from our usual focus on foreign policy and politics to turn our attention to the arts and how and why the same forces that are doing such damage elsewhere are also at work in the arts, impacting not just the lives and livelihoods of artists who are already struggling from the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, but the very core of artistic traditions that are one of the glories of our civilization. To discuss this topic, we're fortunate to have with us today someone uniquely situated to talk about wokeness and the arts and what it means for our culture and specifically what it means for Jewish artists and those who care about Jewish concerns. Daniel Asia is a unique and eclectic Jewish composer, conductor, educator, and writer. He has been the recipient of some of the most prestigious prizes in his field, including the Fulbright and Guggenheim Fellowships. His chamber music is widely performed. He's a composer of five symphonies and an opera, a professor of composition, and the head of the composition department at the University of Arizona School of Music, where he also founded the American Culture and Ideas Initiative, an innovative effort to promote the study of great texts that examine aesthetic and philosophical principles at the core of the nation, to combat cultural illiteracy, and to expand intellectual toleration, to act as a force for free speech an open inquiry in the arts and the humanities. Daniel Asia, welcome to Top Story. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be with you. <clears throat> Great. Well, we're happy to have you. Daniel, a lot of people hear the word wokeness and think just about politics. Why should people who don't necessarily listen to classical music or go to art museum or the theaters care about how it's influencing the arts? Even if people don't go to the arts, uh, it would, is important for them to recognize, it seems to me, that the arts and high culture really have helped society sustain itself in the past, uh, does so now, and should continue into the future. Uh, we live in a time uh, that's exceedingly problematic in that regard because Uh, There's almost no room for high culture, which is to say that popular culture has pushed it into such a tiny corner of uh, of the artistic world that it's hard for it to exist. Having said that, uh, the reason it's so important is because high culture actually deals with uh, issues and matters that are central to our human existence. And uh, if, if those disappear, 
we we make ourselves less rich. We make ourselves poorer in terms of our relation to each other, to the world, to our sense of uh, what the beautiful is and how it affects us. Um, so wokeness is exceedingly important um, in the arts and in education and culture generally. Yeah, I think you make a very important point about how even though people you know who don't, may not experience what you, what you've referred to as high culture, high culture ex- influences everything that we do. It influences the, the popular culture, um, even in ways that I think a lot of people don't understand. So when you know it's sort of it, 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 when that gets corrupted, it's going to have a chain effect on on everything else, isn't it? Uh, I think it does. I, I'm smiling because your comment made me think of uh, the movie um, something uh, Pravda. Am I close to that? Uh, with um, uh, the wonderful actress whose name is now escaping me, and she who's teaching her young apprentice uh, about the clothes that she's wearing. The devil wears Prada. Excuse me. The yeah. devil <laughs> wears Prada. And what she is pointing Meryl out Streep to her and, uh, and <laughs> Anne Hathaway. There you go, Meryl Streep, thank you. So let's use popular culture to teach us a little bit about high culture, which is Meryl Streep tells her, darling, um, look at the clothes that you're wearing. Whether you know it or not, somebody spent a lot of time deciding, one, the color, the shape, the design, everything about it. You might not consider it important, but in fact, it sets the tone for the way we look at each other. Um, a colleague of mine, Robert Gordon, uh, he and I teach a class called Human Achievement and Innovation in the Arts. And uh, among the things he demonstrates is that our clothes uh, do in fact affect how we think about ourselves. That when we wear something, when we wear a tie, for example, it creates a line that creates a sense of symmetry, that creates a sense of upward liftedness. Uh, which is not, by the way, that di- uh, uh, different from uh, looking at the Parthenon and the columns that hold up the Parthenon that uh, have us realize that, in fact, culture and justice are raised up above the ground, that they come from something above us and who we are as human beings, that perhaps it's um, something uh, uh, more uh, more important than we are or, or separate from us. We can talk about God if we want at some point and, and the relationship between ethics and justice and, and something having to do with, um, uh, uh, with the divine. Uh, but certainly a woke culture and culture can and always has, does the, has done the same for us. Whether it's painting, whether it's music, uh, these have always been domains that have been associated with experiencing the transcendent and, um, and, and making note of the transcendent. So if that no longer exists, if we live, live in a solely secular um, society or a public square, it seems to me that we are, we are in part debased. And uh, I'm not going to say that one has to have a relationship to God. I'm going to say that it's important for one, I think, to realize that humans are not the sum and the end of our experience. Uh, Charles Murray talks about in his book, Human Accomplishment. Uh, He says, look, all societies that have produced great works have some notion of the artist, one, as an individual, and then two, as seeking to transcend themselves. It's hard for me to imagine that someone like Mozart was not touched by God. There's no other explanation. I'm sorry. There just isn't. You don't just conceive of pieces in whole unless you're, we could say, superhuman, but unless you have something other than what most of us have. So you can call it whatever you will, but I, I'm delighted to call it a sense of transcendence and, and a, a, me, a way of approaching the divine. Yeah, well, of course, Peter Schaffer in his uh, classic play then was adopted into a popular movie and Amadeus you know, spoke of uh, Mozart as being God's flute, that God was playing the music through, 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 through the hands of Mozart, through his, through his intellect. And uh, I think that's a very attractive theory. There are some other theories about music that I think in that play that are, are dubious or theories about Mozart that are dubious. But I, I think you're really onto something in that art is about 
giving us a sense of the transcendent. Um, if you're not religious, you can call it, you know, you don't have to call it God, but the sense that there is something bigger than us. There's something greater. And that inspires humanity uh, to two great things, to, to understand, uh, you know, really the whole breath, you know, to create a civilization. It's impossible without it. So, yeah, I think you're, you're, you're really on to something important. And, and that's why that which undermines um, you know, the, the foundation of the arts, of, of, of the humanities, is so dangerous for our society as a whole, over and above you know, sort of the political battles that we're fighting over it. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, the point here, I think, or, or at least something to consider. So politics is very important. Clearly, I'm involved in the political arena and occasionally uh, write about that. Um, I think we have forgotten how much and how far downstream politics is from culture and that mm. our politics become debased um, as much or more so as the culture is debased and make it impossible for us to have those political discussions that we would need. What do I mean by that? I got to think about that for a minute. I think I mean that if our general conception of who we are as human beings doesn't include questions of truth, goodness, and beauty, which can be looked at either from a philosophical standpoint or from a religious standpoint. If that's not part of our discussion, if that, does, if that's, if that is not central to our discussion, then we will not be able to have reasonable political discussions. And I think that's where we are right now. I think the yeah. culture is, in fact, so debased. And so um, I, 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 all I can come up right now is, is the word dirty. It's not, it's not rich. It's not full. It's, it's thin. It has no texture. Um, and when that happens, our capability to actually talk in a reasonable manner on a political level also becomes debased. And if there is no sense of the individual in all of this, which, of course, is also at the center of woke culture, uh, which is what uh, uh, this uh, your uh, conversation started with, um, then we have a real problem because then we we have no commonalities. And that's part of woke culture. Again, the only commonality is your the color of your skin at this point. I mean, my view as a composer, of course, is that do I care if somebody is white, black, brown, green, purple, male, female, heterosexual, gay? You can go through all of those categories, and I can't remember all of them. There are too many now to, to enumerate, to try and remember. But the, the answer, of course, is no. Ultimately, this is about the question and the problem of judgment. This is about the question of what actually matters, what actually communicates to us as human beings. Um, again, I'll go back just to, to Murray's uh, comments and human accomplishments. So here's a sociologist, a guy who deals with statistics, uh, who really doesn't think about aesthetic matters, but all of a sudden wanted to enter this world. And he said, how do we know if anything's uh, good or not? In science, we do it by having a theory, proving it through experiments, and then being able to reproduce those experiments. He said, in the artistic domain, it's not a matter of scientific inquiry of, of uh, reproducibility of experiments. But if you can get enough people over enough time who all say, this is pretty cool. You can probably bet that there's some, quote, truth quotient or factor in all of this. So that's why we're able to say at this point, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, they weren't bad. In <laughs> fact, you Not might want to take you might want to take a listen before you reject them all together. It's true. They're, they were white. It's true. As far as we can tell, they were straight, given box over 20 children. Um, and um, they're male, and they were part of European society. So what do we do with that? We say, great, 
you know, they produced works of genius. Are there other people of other colors, of other sex orientation who produce great music? Certainly. Uh, but they're going to be probably in our own time and in the last century because opportunities were not available previously. So that's where we are. To ignore the facts, to, the, to ignore the historical record and what was the nature of human society seems to me to be the height of idiocy. And there's simply no other word for it. You can't change the facts. You can't change history. You can try and change the present in the hopes of changing the future. That I understand. But you certainly don't want to overwhelm or overturn the barrel so, so completely that civilization is destroyed. And that's the problem that I see right now. I see many of our institutions being threatened so strongly that the fundamental nature of our civilization, I think, is at risk. And that's no more so or no less so. It's no, it's no clearer that this is the case uh, than in the arts right now as well. Yeah. I, you know, listening to you um, speaking as a composer, asking yourself, do I care if my listener is of any specific color or gender or identification of a group? And your answer is no, I want to reach them as, as, as fellow human beings. And I was thinking, you know, in, in the dialectic and the catechism of wokeness, that's exactly the wrong answer because they still, you know, they, the, the, the uh, the argument would be that by uh, by not focusing on race or gender or whatever you know uh, whatever these categories are, you are denying them or you're reinforcing uh, you know white uh, the the white supremacy, um, and that leads me to ask you you know as as we're discussing broad principles, you know almost the entire arts world right now seems to be speaking with one voice about the need to focus more on race. Can you speak more about why the obsession with race, which is at the heart of critical race theory and intersectionality, um, is so destructive to the artistic voice? Um, I, I think it's pretty clear, which is that we don't listen to Beethoven because he lived in Vienna, although growing up in Germany. Now, it's not to say that those experiences didn't create or help forge his personality. But the arts, by and large, are about an individual artist sending out into the world his understanding of his particular art form, what he wants to say, and his own soul that comes out through that particular artistic medium. It is a personal experience that is given to, let's, let's, let's talk seriously about the audience, but who is the audience that you just mentioned? It's an audience forged again of individuals. Their response is not collective. They're not told whether to clap or not to clap, although they might have been in the Soviet Union. But rather, it is a human-to-human -human interaction. That's what I think is so cr crucial about it. When you all of a sudden ask the question, oh, am I speaking to that black person? Am I speaking from Barbados, by the way? Or am I speaking to that black person from Oakland? Or am I, when I'm speaking to that Portuguese person in Lisbon, am I speaking to them within that category that we have just placed them in? Or am I communicating to them as a sentient, thinking, feeling, engaged human being whose depth and complicatedness I have no way of understanding? I don't know what, what they are. I only know that I'm doing my best to communicate something of importance to them. Whether they are, are able to receive it, whether they do receive it, the depth of the reception that they engage in, that I can't control. None of that, none of, none of that is, is, is something that I can actually somehow manage. I can only do the best I very can as an artist. That's my job. That's what I have to do. I have to be true to myself. I have, and any artist does. 
So if we are now saying to the artist, by the way, we want you to engage in politics. We want you to think about your, your uh, realm and your art form, the art domain that you work in from a political standpoint. We are no better and no worse than what the Soviet Union was. We are telling artists that they have to create for the people. And either your work is acceptable by the nomenclatura who decide whether it's acceptable or it's not. You have no control. I mean, Shostakovich lived his life in fear, deathly fear, never knowing if the next time he answered his door, a bullet was going to be uh, put through his forehead. That's where we're coming to now in this country. That's, I, I think it's that serious. And I, and I say that uh, with all understanding how serious I am. In other words, we could see the destruction of the arts as we know it if we don't fight back and return to the nature of what the uh, what artistic expression is actually supposed to be. Yeah, I, I think you know, I, I think you're 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 making a very clear and very important point about how politics, um, however it is expressed, can distort art and can, you know, basically turn artists into uh, scared sheep. Um, now, of course, um, we don't have a KGB. Um, you know, we don't have Stalin's secret police knocking at the doors of artists. But we do have, um, I, I would argue, um, sort of latter-day commissars acting at uh, artistic companies, whether it's theater companies now, you know, pledging allegiance to, you know, critical race or intersectionality, or even at the Metropolitan Opera, where they now, you know, they hired this year at a time of when they're going broke, you know, and don't have have money, you know, and have been pleading poverty, um, they hired a, a diversity, um, you know, executive who is supposed to, who has very loosely defined duties other than to just ride herd over everybody at that company to force them to think more about race. Um, and, you know, that has, I mean, you know, the, that sort of thing and getting in the crosshairs of the diversity executive or whatever it's called, at various, you know, artistic endeavors is, you know, it doesn't get you dragged off to um, sort of a critical race theory gulag in this country, thank God, not yet, but it does get you canceled. Um, is, isn't that really, um, you know, as much as we don't want to make inaccurate or sort of hyperbolic comparisons, isn't that more or less the same thing? Because what future is there uh, for artists who are going to go against this, this trend? I think you've stated it exactly correctly, which is, yes, there are no physical locations of gulags now. But with cancel culture, we now have individuals who have been placed in an isolation chamber, which is uh, very similar. They're not doing forced hard labor but they're not going to be able to work and they're not going to be able to have the product of their imaginations uh, given over to a public who awaits them. Um, oh, look, I have a, a colleague, a recent colleague who I met who uh, talked about the problem now in classical music. Uh, one of our uh, uh, most well-known cl uh, critics uh, Anthony Tomasini of the New York Times suggested yeah, the chief that arts critic of the New York Times, chief arts think, yes. critic of the New York Times, which is a pretty important position, kind of the okay. high priest of, of popular culture, not quite the uh, the commissar for the arts, but <laughs> certainly in a person of tremendous influence. That's right. Who suggested so maybe it's time now that we uh, not have performers who are trying out for orchestras. Uh, perform behind a screen, that we should allow who and what they are to be part of the interview process. To which one of my colleagues said, well, why have an interview then? Why not just have people send in their headshots? Now, yes, it's said somewhat flippantly, but there's a certain quotient of truth in that. The problem is, for somebody to play on one of the greatest orchestras, they have to not only play in tune, 
but they have to give of their soul. That's part of what they're supposed to do. They have to be able to interpret things. They have to be great. Um, so how are you going to handle this problem? Should you allow a personal influence to be a part? Somebody would see somebody and say, oh, I know it's so-and-so students, a student, I'm a good friend. You know, it'd be nice for that, uh, that teacher if her student was in our orchestra. Or, uh, yes, that person is black. Um, uh, we don't have many blacks in the orchestra. He or she doesn't play quite as well as others, but, you know, we need to have greater representation. Well, that's not the way you have a great orchestra. And that's not the way you have great performances of great music, whether it's new or old. And we have a hard enough time in the arts now if we're going to subject organizations to the possibility that they're not going to be allowed to uh, create the best product they can. Now, an addendum to what I've just said is that, gee, it happens that most great orchestras now and this is in this country and around the world, are made up of a very large minority, if not a majority, of Asians. They used to be made up of a large minority or majority of Jews. Why? Because in Jewish culture, it was very important that kids play an instrument. And some of them became really good and a lot of them ended up in orchestras. In Asian culture now, um, Asian families want their kids to play instrument and play really well. The, the result is most of our orchestras uh, are populated with large uh, numbers of, of Asians and by the way, Asian women. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, wh why is that the case? Again, they've practiced. They've worked really hard. They are really good. So are the doors open for any other minorities? Of course they are. They are certainly also, by the way, in our universities. The doors have been open for minorities for years and years and years. And uh, the percentage of minorities has gone up, uh, not as quickly as our woke uh, segment of the population would like. To which I think the answer is really a pretty simple one. And that is, those who wish to enter through the door, they are wide open. All they have to do is practice, get their credentials. This really deals with any job of any sort in the arts or in the, in the wider world. It's also simply the case that anybody who wants to study and witness and become part of this great conversation in Western culture, it's been wide open. The door is there for anybody who wants to step through. That wasn't true 50 or 60 years ago. I get that. I'm with that. Um, but the results of certainly the civil rights movement of the 60s is that anybody who wants to march through and walk up to the gate and open it, it's there. So what we're, what we're not recognizing, of course, is how many uh, people, whether it's in, uh, individuals or groups, have shot themselves in the foot um, in this regard. One of them has to go to Patrick Moynihan's comment on the, the problems of the black family of the late 60s. Uh, Thomas Sowell's comments on, look, different uh, segments of the population that come from different locations have uh, in the world who have migrated here have different strengths and different weaknesses and different predilections, by the way. That's just part and parcel of who we are. You're not going to be able to legislate uh, uh, down to the, a fine percentage of who is going to succeed at what particular uh, aspect that they would like to uh, uh, um, uh, pursue in society. It's, it's always going to be differentials that, that are going to occur. Well, that's also not apparently acceptable to woke culture. In other words, we're moving away from everything that we, f that we were worried that we were when civil rights started, which that there were going to be quotas, and in fact there was going to be an inversion of uh, the categories that would be favored and disfavored. And right now, woke culture has simply said, whites are bad, minorities are good. It has nothing to do with the nature of the individual's accomplishment, nor of their capabilities, nor of their goodness, for that matter. Those are all categories which have now been relegated to a secondary position behind race. It is now all about race. And what is race? 
It's in my view, I happen to disagree with Heather McDonald on this. It's pigmentation. You know, I woke up a few nights ago and I thought, gee, you know, my bones have the same color as anybody else's bones. This was apropos of, I guess, having been to the cave of Machpelah, where the bones of Abraham uh, supposedly I'm thinking, here I am in a mosque that's um, used now uh, 40% by Jews, 40% by Muslims, and they're arguing over this place. And guess what? You know, ultimately, we have the same bones. We look pretty much alike. Uh, pigmentation, in my view, is a small, a small difference um, that is essentially not particularly important to who we are as human beings. Well, that is the science, um, and we're often um, ch scolded um, by people in the chattering classes to to pay attention to science, at least with regard to some subjects, but <laughs> clearly not when it comes to race, because the science says that race is, is a very artificial construct. I mean, we're all human beings. Um, we have divided ourselves, and we, you know, we've categorized, and that's why we have a legacy of past discrimination and which we, you know, society is far from perfect. America is far from perfect, and we have to continue to struggle against it. But, you know, when, when you spoke of um, Tomasini's proposal for, um, specifically, he was talking about the New York Philharmonic, and wanted and believe that uh, the New York Philharmonic should look more like New York um, and have greater representation from minorities. And he noted that, you know, there was, you know, there was only one principal player who was black, Anthony McGill, the great clarinetist, you know, the the point is what he was basically calling for is reinstituting the same sy system that existed, uh, you know, 60 years ago when the color line was broken at the Philharmonic, when people did just go audition, they did just show up and people would see whether they were friends or somehow would fit in. Um, that's why, um, you know, 70 years ago, you know, sym symphony orchestras were almost uniformly white males. Um, it took blind audition to integrate them for women and then for Asians, as you say, Asians now. And I, I when I wrote about, you know, in response to that Tomasini article for a piece I, I wrote about in, in National Review, you know, I sort of did a statistical breakdown and it appeared that certainly for the New York Philharmonic and um, the Philadelphia Orchestra, for example, I'm, I'm speaking from outside Philadelphia, um, more than a quarter of um, the players in both of these great orchestras are Asian. Um, in order to to uh, adjust to the uh, the uh, racial quotas, which he is more or less, he was more or less demanding, and which sort of fits in with the whole concept of wokeness, inevitably, um, you know, somebody's got to lose, and in this case, it would be Asians. You know, they would be, uh, you know, in, in terms of openings, it would be much harder for an Asian artist to, to be hired to play in, in that orchestra if race was the primary uh, thing that they were looking for. And this just goes against, you know, and, and, you know, the other point is, do we care about excellence? I mean, we talked, you know, I opened by speaking about meritocracy, um, you know, speaking of who represents New York. Well, I don't think anybody would argue that, for example, the New York Knicks of the NBA, of the National Basketball Association should, um, you know, uh, hire players on the basis of race in order to make it look more like New York um, and therefore have, have more, you know, whites, Hispanics, Asians in proportion to the population of New York when in fact, um, as, as in most NBA teams right now, the overwhelming majority, if not the preponderance of, of the players on the Knicks and all the other NBA teams or in the Nets in Brooklyn, um, are, are African Americans. So, we're, you know, so um, we, we wouldn't stand for a diminution dimun of excellence in the sports world, at least I don't think anybody rational would. Why would we be doing that for the arts except by saying that the arts don't really matter except as they are political totems. I think you've hit the nail on the head. In other words, that's the, um, the example that I would always give as well. Uh, sports seems to be somehow outside of the uh, square in which you want to talk about these kinds of issues. There it's clear you want teams that win. Therefore, you want teams that are excellent. 
Therefore, you will do whatever you can to find the people who together will make the team the best that it can possibly be. It seems to me that culture and high culture uh, is exactly the same. Uh, let's even go to pop culture. It's my hope that in popular culture, the, 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 the bands that have the best players who communicate the best and uh, um, who provide satisfaction for the entertainment quality that they're trying to satisfy, that they are the best bands. Um, why somehow education and high culture should not be in, in the similar state simply makes absolutely no sense to me. Except the, uh, the, the reason that I think this is done, I think we're seeing uh, the effects, no question, of the 60s. Um, Roger Kimball's book, of course, is called, one of them is called Tenured Radicals. And I think that's where we are now. And if they, weren't, if they aren't tenured, then they're newbies coming up having been apprenticed to those tenured radicals. And um, because of the weakness of our administrative class, and what do I mean by that? There isn't a president that I know of, except for perhaps at Hillsdale College and a few others, who have been able to um, fight against the idiocy of woke culture and anything that is considered important on the left. I think they have concluded that it behooves them and it is simpler simply to acquiesce because if you don't, you will be... Um, hit with uh, lawsuits, and you'll be hit with demonstrations. And what they fear the most is um, any upsetting of the peace. That's what they, uh, I think, admire the most. And thus on campuses, I mean, what is woke culture? You've mentioned, yes, the, the first and primary um, uh, aspect of it is question of race namely systematic race. Just as an addendum, that became the raison d'etre for all of the arts at the university at which I teach, the University of Arizona, that we are now, as artists, supposed to uh, fight systemic racism with our art. So, and clearly, the majority of my colleagues and faculty agree with that. They're fine with that. As, as, as we all know, know, know fairly well, uh, it's been documented uh, extensively that in the social sciences and the humanities, a good 90 to 95 percent of all faculty are on the left, which is to say there's an absolute preponderance of those who agree with these positions. So... Uh, the other issues involve, as you've said, follow the science. Of course, sustainability is now part of this, our scientific ethos. What it means is not clear. In other words, climate change is, is a fact. It's not something to be discussed. And of course, the ways of, of uh, working on it don't include the things that make the most sense to most scientists. Great, you've got a problem with climate? We should be building more nuclear reactors. That's clear from everybody's standpoint. Uh, we should be using natural gas. Oh, but that's what we get from fracking, and somehow fracking is environmentally uh, um, destructive of Mother Earth, right? And you would never want to lacerate your mother. So God forbid that you should consider the benefits of fracking. Or let's even put this to, uh, to another test, and that is, we know that economics are important. Now, what is economics the study of? Economics is the question of how to use scarce resources when there aren't enough. Okay, so if there are scarce resources, one also has to look at other questions uh, in relation to decisions made about one particular domain. So great, you want to have a clean earth? You want to have good climate? That's great. Uh, do you want to have the power... Um, do you want to raise the power of countries like uh, the Soviet, uh, the R Russia and or Saudi Arabia? Is that something that is an acceptable trade-off? Well, we don't talk about trade-offs because nobody's capable of thinking larger 
uh, about how various issues are affected by different domains, right? One is just, oh, we got to save the earth. The other is systemic racism and America is terrible. Really? America is the worst in terms of racism? Look at a few other countries around the world where slavery still exists. As far as I know, we don't have approved slavery in the United States of America. Oh, we have problems with poor people. Poor people? Excuse me. Our poor people, by and large, live in a house and they have a car or two and they have TVs and they eat pretty well. That's very different than the poor people in India and, uh, and, and poor people in the gulags, and we can use that word, of China. So to reduce this, this reductionism is so dangerous and so anti-intellectual and so devoid of real serious deep thought and that this is being promulgated in our cultural communities and in all of our major universities. Parenthetically, by the way, this is worst at our Ivy schools, which su supposedly should be our top institutions, that that's why you and I are having this discussion, because it's so frightening. Yeah, I, I, you know, we know that um, college campuses, and you're located at a college campus, um, are battlefields for, for free speech with respect to attempts to uh, <clears throat> silence non-woke or conservative ideas. Can you give us some examples of how that works in the world of music as well? Uh, yeah. So, uh, all of a sudden... Uh, you will find that more black soloists will be hired. Black conductors will be hired. Pulitzer Prizes are being given to composers of color. Uh, you will see that opera libretti uh, are completely topical but not even in the sense that John Adams' operas were topical, which is to say Nixon in China or uh, Klinghoffer. But no, no, simply talking about political We'll get to Klinghoffer in a little bit. Uh, but yes. Okay, great. So we'll get to the death of Klinghoffer. Um, uh, to, 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 to being so uh, present, the, the only opera libretti that I think are, that you're seeing now uh, deal with questions of systemic racism. I mean, that's, uh, those are the, the, the libretti du jour. There's no question about that. Um, you've also mentioned that every organization in the musical uh, field is decrying now systemic racism and looking at a mirror, mirror at themselves um, and somehow finding that that was lacking and now this will be not part of their focus, but their primary focus yet again. This will be their primary focus. What does it mean for the League of Symphony Orchestras to talk about systemic racism as their primary focus? What does it mean for a university, a college of fine arts, to say that its primary focus now is systemic racism? A, a symphony orchestra's job is to play music great, right? To present it as best it can. It is not responsible for, nor should it be, political issues within society. In other words, if the phrase, the personal is now political, was used in the 60s and 70s, guess what? Now it is so to an exponential uh, rate in a way that's turning us into if not, as we said before, a Soviet Union, a form of a totalitarian society where we can't differentiate between the private sphere and the public sphere or between different aspects of the public sphere, in which I would place the arts, by the way, and the, and, and the private sphere, or the function of different aspects of that, that, it, that are part of our society that shouldn't be involved in the political. We need to differentiate those. Yeah, I, you know, I think there, you know, you can sort of cherry pick lots of different examples. I, you know, I've, I've written about this myself. Um, certainly some examples within the world of, uh, you know, painting and museums um, 
I noted at one point last year, um, a curator at the Metropolitan Museum of New York noted on social media that people tearing down statues for various political re reasons reminded him of, you know, the destruction of, um, you know, classical works of art in, in Paris during the revolution. And he was then subjected to this Chinese cultural style, revolution style struggle session, which he was forced to... Uh, you know, uh, admit fault and, and apologize. And when the New York Times wrote about this really scandalous uh, issue, you know, they couldn't come up with a single person who would decry it, who would dare to decry what had happened. It. And another example was when um, the Gardner Museum in, in Boston um, put on an exhibition of uh, six, um, you know, great uh, masterpieces by the Renaissance artist Titian, which had never been reunited together. They were painted together and then, uh, you know, for, for Philip II of Spain in the 16th century and were reunited on the North American continent uh, for the first time for people to look at. And yet the museum there decided they needed to put up trigger warnings um, to warn people that the paintings which depicted, um, you know, which was a, was poesy, uh, you know, of, of how, what the works of Ovid, the, the classical Latin poet. And um, the trigger warnings were basically to tell them, don't try this at home, um, because Zeus was uh, variously, you know, engaged in acts of sexual violence or, you know, seducing women, mortal women. And just, you know, I thought to myself, well, you know, the people who first saw these paintings, you know, which were the grandees of the court of Philip II in uh, the 1570s, uh, Spain, uh, they had a lot of problems in 1570s Spain. It was not a very tolerant place. But I don't think any of the people who, who, who saw those paintings the first time needed to be told not to try the same thing that, 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 that Zeus was doing in the paintings. <laughs> and yet, um, the really smart, cultured people um, who run these institutions like the Gardner felt that that was necessary. Um, you know, what does that say about our society right now? Uh, you're absolutely right. Another example I'd want to bring up, I suppose, in the, again, in the, in the visual art domain, since you've, you've taken us there, is the, well, we don't know if it's a cancellation, I think, or a simply perpetual delay of a show of the work of Philip Guston. And I'm sure you've, you you know about that as well, but some of our, our listeners and viewers may not, which is, so Philip Guston, here's a, a wonderful painter, um, at least somewhat associated with the abstract expressionist school of the 50s and 60s and on into the 70s, who uh, included pictures of the clan or images of the clan in his artwork. And it was thought, that somehow viewers who saw this would not be able to differentiate between thinking that Guston was deploring the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, or whether he was actually supportive of them. Now, of course, Guston, was a, who changed his name, was a nice Jewish guy, brought up Jewish. There's absolutely no question of his stance towards the Klan. So just as you stated, the question is, really? Is our viewing public, is our listening public so childish, so ill-informed, so unaware that they can't think for themselves and come to conclusions about this? Are we so childish that we can't look at various human and, as you said, I'm using now godly acts with a small g of Zeus or Neptune and come to a, well, not a conclusion, but rather think rather deeply about what the artist is trying to tell us about this. In other words, we human beings have never been saints. So does that mean that we can't talk about the fact that we haven't always been saints and how, in fact, we've become better? Isn't that in part what artists are supposed to do is bring us these questions? In fact, isn't al almost all art uh, by fold, by whatever, which is to say, 
they are aesthetic objects, but they are also there to teach us about an idea or present an idea that an artist is trying to present us. You've just brought it up with Titian, right? He's dealing with particular ideas also, as well as presented in the most aesthetic and beautiful way possible. Well, those are always questions. Those are, uh, I mean, a, a question of murder, uh, uh, the question of killing, of taking a life. It's, it's not, we're living in a time, sorry, after uh, Rittenhouse, just a day or two, a verdict in regards to uh, an action. So the taking of a life is a deep question. When, in, when is it allowed? When is it not allowed? Yes, we, we accept that human life is, is, is deep and great. And of course, in the Jewish tradition, we say that a Jewish, the destruction of a, Jew, of a life is like the destruction of the entire world. Having said that, we also accept that there are just wars, that there are times that one has to fight to support um, or to defend against certain ideologies. You just mentioned uh, 15th century Spain. Well, this was a time of auto de fe. This is time when people were burnt at the stake because they didn't believe the correct ideology. Do we accept the fact that the world is a better place, that uh, Nazism did not conquer the world? Do we accept the fact that, I think the, fa yeah, the fact that the Soviet Union disintegrated, that we are better for that, that it wasn't a good society? Well, we're at a point now in world culture where, remember, uh, there's no truth. There's only your truth and my truth. And we can't accept that, that, that facts uh, actually exist. Even if we do, it's only your narrative of stringing those facts together against my narrative of stringing certain facts together. Um, is that really true? And this brings us back to, to a, a matter that I think we at least mention, and that's a question of judgment. By the way, in woke culture, you're not supposed to judge except matters of whether systematic racism is the ultimate evil in the world. That we have to accept. That's a judgment. Everything else is left so that you don't judge. We're not allowed to judge whether music, any music is better than any other music. We're not allowed to question whether any artwork is actually better or greater than any other artwork. Everything is all equal. We're now really in Tom, Tom, Thomas Friedman's complete level playing field, not only in terms of individual responsibility within a democracy, but also as to anyone's view of any object from an aesthetic nature or a historical nature. If that's the case, we're in deep trouble. And that's why I've decided I need to come out and fight this because I consider it so that it threatens our, our notions of democracy so, so greatly. Yeah, I, I think that's the, that you've gotten right to it and why this is such an important issue. I'd, I'd like to go more into sort of the comparisons with Soviet, you know, with what uh, socialist realism, which was how uh, <laughs> the Soviets uh, distorted art to make it more political. But I want to, before we um, run out of time, to ask you, how, whether wokeness sometimes promotes anti-Semitism in the arts. And by that, I mean not just individual acts of ex exclusion or comments made in academic or uh, artistic sentiments, but anti-Semitic art or art that delegitimizes Jews or Israel. And you mentioned uh, before uh, John Adams's opera, The Death of Klinghoffer, which um, premiered some 30 years ago and um, I think seven years ago because that's when I wrote wrote the review of it at the at the time um, it, it appeared at the Metropolitan Opera to um, great acclaim from the arts world um, but uh, you know much criticism from the Jewish world because it basically uh, was uh, you know legitimized put the uh, right of a Jew to live, uh, in this case, um, Leon Klinkhofer, an elderly Jew who in real life was murdered by terrorists in, in, um, in the 1980s, by Palestinian terrorists in the 1980s, and the right of the Palestinian terrorists to kill him. Um, and uh, this was, you know, treated, you know, with this, this was treated with great applause in the artistic world. Um, but I think it was a uh, foreshadowing, as, as I thought at the time, because things have inevitably gotten worse, as often they do. 
um, for legitimizing anti-Semitism in the public square in a way that, you know, it wasn't before. So tell me, you know, from the position of an artist, somebody who's, you know, on the inside of the artistic world, uh, do you see uh, how wokeness is is uh, sort of giving a permission slip for anti-Semitism? Uh, I don't know if we've mentioned, or I, th I think you did, uh, mention this question of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's, I think, where, where this problem resides, uh, which again is to say that uh, one's morality or, or morality is not at the center of discussion either in, either in the art world or in the political world, but rather it's a question of who is considered, and I think I have to underline that word considered, the underdog and what that means. So artists, I think by definition, are politically stupid. It's not our realm. It's not where we're supposed to be. Um, this started, uh, we can have positions, but I don't think we can support them or, or, or oppose them, particularly easily with our art. Uh, a friend, um, Jay Nordlinger, you know, says, look, so you listen to a piece of music and the composer has told you it's all about the ocean or the sea. Okay, great. You know, and if the composer said, you know, this piece is really about the forest. It's all about the forest. Would you know which is which? Probably not. I don't think so. You might be able to say whether a piece is about uh, the pacific nature of man or, or the quiescence of nature or about uh, 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 the, the destructive qualities that exist both in human capabilities and in, uh, and in nature. That you could probably tell, and we understand those sort of emotional differences. But when it gets specific, it's hard. This takes us back, whether we like it or not, to someone like Wagner, right? Okay, Wagner, what's my view on Wagner? Having heard the ring in its entirety in Seattle, there's no question in my mind that this is a great composer. Was he an absolute jerk? Yeah, he was a jerk. He was a pathetic, immoral guy. Guess what? Artists can be as immoral as the next guy and still be able to do something else that's great. I would assume that you could have, excuse me, a, a wonderful NFL quarterback, but the guy may not be a particularly moral person. It's possible. Possible. Um, Adams, I, I think if case, you read the sports news, you would find out that that's more than possible. Exactly, exa exactly. And we say, okay, you know, a guy can be a, be a great quarterback, a great tackle, and he can be a jerk as a human being. I think in this case, John entered into something that is, was beyond his, uh, his depth. Um, yeah, I think he was uh, uh, partaking of moral equivalency in, a, in a, 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 an, a, an obnoxious, immoral way. I think the arts community is probably supportive of the narrative, quote unquote, of the Palestinians because they know nothing. They've never explored this. They've never looked at any facts. They've never looked at, uh, um, at how this has played out. And therefore, yes, they are complicit um, in anti-Semitism and anti-Israel bashing, without a doubt. Um, if I were John, I'd withdraw the peace. I'm not John. He apparently thinks it's fine. Composers have withdrawn pieces. It's not, not well. Not indeed, the interview. entire arts world tells them it's fine. <laughs> uh, that's correct. That's correct. They tell them. They tell them it's fine. And the entire arts world has now said that we are a country that engages in, or has been, that is systematically racist. They can and say whatever they want. Irredeemably racist. Ir yeah. Irredeemably racist. There, there you go. So I don't know what that means, by the way, because if there's no hope, what the hell? You know, why, why, what, what, what should you do? Just go out and, uh, and do whatever the hell you want. Excuse me for swearing at that point. But then there's no point. So um, the seem, it seems to me that the whole argument at this point has become um, intellectually base and ludicrous. That's the problem. That's where we are. And yes, we now have a... Um, uh, Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity in the College of Fine Arts. Every other college has one, by the way, I'm sure at this point, not to mention other departments, not to mention at the administrative level, our previous head of uh, diversity and inclusion said, this is ridiculous. Do you know how much money is being spent 
on these kinds of positions. Let's consolidate, have two or three people. That's all you need. I can assure you now we have 20 or 25 people each getting paid over 100,000 bucks. Uh, you count it. You, t- you total it up. That's millions of dollars that should be going into education. But by the way, education has now become really the second or third uh, notion of what the university is about. This, the, most universities now are really about creating equity, as you've described it, and about fighting systemic racism. Forget about the notion of, of education. Yes, I was director of the American Culture and Ideas Initiative. I've now created an independent 501c3 called the Center for American Culture and Ideas. Why? Because the ideas that I promulgate are simply too problematic within the university at this point. Mm. Yeah, that, that's um, where there we you are. go. That that that's that's, uh, that's the that's the problem in a nutshell. And I think yeah, um, yeah. you know we've in, in other episodes of Top Story we've talked a lot about intersectionality and the way in the political sphere it gives permission to anti-Semitism by denig- by classifying Jews and the state of Israel as a, a function of white privilege. And I think this works in the arts as well. No uh, Daniel, you have given us so. Unfortunately, we're at, <laughs> almost at the end of our time. You've given us so much to think about, and um, just we barely skimmed the surface of these ideas. I hope at some point we'll be able to to have this conversation again and go into it even more deeply and uh, talk about the further progress of uh, of this struggle um, for for ideas and for the arts. Um, in the meantime, thank you for, for joining us and uh, giving us the benefit of your insights and, and your teaching. Uh, thank you to our audience for tuning in, for logging on, whether uh, you're on, listening to us on the various uh, podcast uh, audio platforms like Spotify, Google, Amazon, um, or wherever you listen to, to podcasts, or if you're watching us on the JNS YouTube st- channel or uh, if you're watching us on um, JBS TV on your local Jewish cable news channel. Um, Thank you. Please like us, subscribe, give us good reviews. And thanks again for watching and listening. And we'll see you again next week. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.